I don't believe a serious study of the Constitution can be made without looking at the public debates over the document. After the Constitutional Convention sent the proposed Constitution to the stage for ratification, a great debate was had over its pros and cons. Supporters of the document as proposed, Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison, published essays in New York State newspapers under the pseudonym Publius. These essays are collectively known as the Federalist Papers. Meanwhile, several authors published articles and essays opposing, or at least cautioning, a rush to adopt the proposed Constitution under many pseudonyms. These became known as the Anti-Federalist Papers. In this article, we'll look at the first papers from each group. Both Federalist I and Anti-Federalist I deal with the same topic. Should the states ratify the newly proposed Constitution? So we'll do that next on the Constitution Study. Hello there, Everyday Americans. Paul Engel here with the Constitution Study, where we read and study the Constitution, teach your eyes and generation to be free. I'm glad you could join me today. You know, I've wanted for years to write a book comparing the Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers based on topics. Take a topic, look at the Federalist side, look at the Anti-Federalist side, and put them in an easier-to-understand language. The Federalist and Anti-Federalist papers were written in a more elevated language of the day that's harder for us modern Americans to read. So it takes time to really go through them. As I go through the quotes today, they may be a little harder to understand than most of my usual fare. But I think if we take the time to really go through this, we get a better understanding of not only what the Constitution says, but why it says what it says, and maybe some things we should be looking out for. So I'll talk more about the website and other things at the end of the episode. But for now, let's get into the Federalist and Anti-Federalist number one. While the Federalist and Anti-Federalist are often claimed to be for and against the Constitution, respectively, a closer look at their writings seems to show that the Anti-Federalists were no less patriotic than the Federalists. Rather, having recently fought a war against a powerful central government, they were not ready to rush into another one. A better description of the differences would seem to be that the Federalists wanted a strong central government to protect the Union, while the Anti-Federalists wanted to ensure the rights of the individuals were protected. Let's start with Federalist number one and the argument for adopting the proposed Constitution. The first of the Federalist Papers was written by Alexander Hamilton and published in the Independent Journal under the pseudonym Publius. After an unequivocal experience of the inefficiency of the subsisting federal government, you are called upon to deliberate on a new Constitution for the United States of America. While our current federal government was created by the Constitution of the United States, it was not the first federal government for the United States of America. The government created under the Articles of Confederation had many issues, but mainly it had responsibility without the power to fulfill them. Probably the most well-known was the fact that the federal government under the Articles of Confederation could levy taxes against the states, but had no mechanism to force them to pay. So in Article 8 of the Article States, all charges of war and other expenses that shall be incurred for the common defense or general welfare and allowed by the United States and Congress assembled shall be defrayed out of a common treasury, which shall be supplied by the several states in proportion to the value of all land within each state. There was no mechanism to make sure the states supplied their part of the expenses. While many anti-federalists claim that federalists wished to establish an aristocracy, that's not what the federalists stated. It has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country by their conduct and example to decide the important question whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. Could the people establish good government on their own? Or did the government need to be forced upon them? If there be any truth in the remark, the crisis at which we are arrived may with propriety be regarded as the era in which that decision is to be made, and a wrong election of the part we shall act may, in this view, deserve to be considered as a general misfortune of mankind. 
The decision of what kind of government would be set up for the young republic would be up to the people, as they would generally suffer the consequences. Happy will it be if our choice should be directed by a judicious estimate of our true interests, unperplexed and unbiased by considerations not connected with the public good. The Federalists claim to desire a fair consideration of their position, their support of the drafted Constitution. What do they see as their obstacles? Among the most formidable of the obstacles which the new Constitution will have to encounter may readily be distinguished the obvious interest of a certain class of men in every state to resist all changes which may hazard a diminution of the power, emolument, and consequence of the office they hold under the state establishments, and the perverted ambition of another class of men who will either hope to aggrandize themselves by confusion of their country or will flatter themselves with fair prospects of elevation from the subdivision of the empire into several partial confederacies than from its union under one government. It seems power and ambition are nothing new in this country. There are some who resist all change, whether for good or for ill. There are others whose ambition would drive them to place their own prospects over those of their country. And a future reason for caution in this respect might be drawn from the reflection that we are not always sure that those who advocate the truth are influenced by purer principles than their antagonists. Ambition, avarice, personal animosity, party opposition, and many other motives not more laudable than these are apt to operate as well upon those who support as those who oppose the right side of a question. Both sides claimed they were guided by purer principles than their opponents. Except for the older language, this could just as easily be a campaign flyer from a recent election. Whose principles are purer? Could both be pure, yet still disagree? And yet, however just these sentiments will be allowed to be, we have already sufficient indications that it will happen in this as all former cases of great national discussion. A torrent of angry and malignant passions will be let loose. To judge from the conduct of the opposite parties, we shall be led to conclude that they will mutually hope to evidence the justness of their opinions and to increase the number of their converts by the loudness of their disseminations and the bitterness of their invectives. Needless to say, there were many accusations and name-calling from both sides, although as we'll see when we review Anti-Federalist No. 1, Mr. Hamilton has a point. That's not to say he wasn't willing to throw a few verbal jabs at his opponents. An enlightened zeal for the energy and efficiency of government will be stigmatized as the offspring of a temper fond of despotic power and hostile to the principles of liberty. An overscrupulous jealousy of danger to the rights of the people, which is more commonly the fault of the head than of the heart, will be represented as mere pretense and article, the stale bait for popularity at the expense of the public good. Yes, the Anti-Federalists stigmatized what Mr. Hamilton refers to as the energy and efficiency of government. Then again, a look at Washington, D.C. today shows that the Anti-Federalists concerned over such a powerful government should have been better heated. On the other hand, it will be equally forgotten that the vigor of government is essential to the security of liberty, that in the contemplation of a sound and well-informed judgment, their interests can never be separated, and that a dangerous ambition more often lurks behind the specious mask of zeal for the rights of the people than under the forbidden appearance of zeal for the firmness and efficiency of government. History will teach us that the former has been found a much more certain road to the introduction of despotism than the latter, and that of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics, the greatest number have begun their career by paying an obsequious court to the people, commencing demagogues and ending tyrants. Mr. Hamilton makes a valid point. Without a vigorous government to protect the rights of the people, despotism has frequently found a way to power at the expense of those rights. In the course of the preceding observations, I have had an eye, my fellow citizens, to putting you upon your guard against all attempts from whatever quarter to influence your decision in a manner of the utmost moment to your welfare, by any impressions other than those which may result from the evidence of truth. You will, no doubt, at the same time, have collected from the general scope of them that they proceed from a source not unfriendly to the new Constitution. Ultimately, the decision about our nation's future was placed in the hands of her people. Our responsibility to ensure that 
governments at all levels remain servants of the people rather than their masters, has never lessened. However, history has shown that we the people have become more interested in being ruled than governed. Yes, my countrymen, I owe to you that, after having given it an attentive consideration, I am clearly of opinion it is your interest to adopt it. I am convinced that this is the safest course for your liberty, your dignity, and your happiness. Being a Federalist and one willing to spend the time and effort to write most of the Federalist papers, it should be no surprise that Alexander Hamilton believes that the safest course for the people is to adopt the Constitution as drafted. That, however, is not to say that he was unaware of efforts to thwart its adoption. But the fact is that we already hear it whispered in the private circles of those who oppose the new Constitution that the 13 states are of too great extent for any general system, and that we must of necessity resort to separate confederacies of distinct portions of the whole. Should the 13 states join together, or would that nation be too large and unwieldy? Would the people be better served by a number of smaller confederacies? For nothing can be more evident that those who are able to take an enlarged view of the subject than the alternative of an adoption of the new constitution or a dismemberment of the union. It will therefore be of use to begin by examining the advantages of that union, the certain evils and the probable dangers to which every state will be exposed from its dissolution. This shall accordingly constitute the subject of my next address. Now that there are 50 states in our union, what can we observe? Before I answer that question, let us consider the other side of the argument. The first of the Anti-Federalist Papers was published in the Boston Gazette and Country Journal. In a somewhat ironic twist, the author of this essay, John DeWitt, used the pseudonym of Federalist. I am pleased to see a spirit of inquiry burst the band of constraints upon the subject of the new plan for considering the governments of the United States, as recommended by the late convention. If it is suitable to the genius and habits of the citizens of these states, it will bear the strictest scrutiny. Mr. DeWitt made the point that if the proposed constitution was worthy of support, it should be able to bear up under strict scrutiny. The people are the grand inquest who have a right to judge of its merits. Both Mr. Hamilton and DeWitt agree that the people have the right to be the ultimate judge of whether the proposed constitution should be ratified. The hideous demon of aristocracy has hitherto had so much influence as to bar the channels of investigation, preclude the people from inquiry, and to extinguish every spark of liberal information of its qualities. As I've already pointed out, the Anti-Federalists were concerned that the United States could become a land of aristocracy at the expense of the liberty of the American people. Their concerns about those in power using censorship to deprive everyday Americans of the information they needed to make good decisions is nothing new in this land. Those furious zealots who are for cramming it down the throats of the people without allowing them either time or opportunity to scan or weigh it in the balance of their understandings bear the same marks in their features as those who have been long wishing to erect an aristocracy in this commonwealth of Massachusetts. Their menacing cry is for a rigid government it matters little to them of what kind, provided it answers that description. As the plan now offered comes something near their wishes and is the most consonant to their views of any that we can hope for, they come boldly forward and demand its adoption. They brand with infamy every man who is not as determined and zealous in its favor as themselves. They cry aloud, the whole must be swallowed or none at all, thinking thereby to preclude any amendment. They are afraid of having it abated of its present rigid aspect. In addition to their concerns about a rigid government about to deprive the people of their rights and liberties, the Anti-Federalists saw the Federalists as attempting to rush the adoption of the Constitution before the people had a chance to properly read and digest it. And that's rather like politicians today who tell us we have to pass the bill so you can find out what's in it. They have strived to overawe or seduce printers to stifle and obstruct at free discussion and have endeavored to hasten it to a decision before the people can duty reflect upon its properties. In order to deceive them, they incessantly declare that none can discover any defect in the system but bankrupts who wish to know government, and offers of the present government who fear to lose a part of their power. These zealous partisans may injure their own cause, and endanger the public tranquility 
by impeding a proper inquiry. The people may suspect the whole to be a dangerous plan from such covered and designing schemes to enforce it upon them. It seems partisan name-calling and most likely hyperbole are nothing new in the American politics. Where the federal is attempting to censor misinformation, much like the federal government does today, or with the anti-federalists using these claims to derail their political opponents. One thing is for sure, while the federalists wanted a stronger federal government, the anti-federalists wanted stronger states. I had rather be a free citizen of the small republic of Massachusetts than an oppressed subject of the great American empire. While the claim that the anti-federalists were against ratification of the proposed constitution is quite common, that's not entirely true. If we can confederate upon terms that will secure to us our liberties, it is an object highly desirable because of its additional security to the whole. If the proposed plan proves such a one, I hope it will be adopted. But if it will endanger our liberties as it stands, let it be amended in order to which it must and ought to be open to inspection and free inquiry. Would the proposed constitution secure the people's liberties or endanger them? That's the central contention between the two groups. However, it appears Mr. DeWitt's greatest concern is the speed with which the proposed constitution is being ratified. It will first be allowed that many undesigning citizens may wish his adoption from the best motives, but these are modest and silent when compared to the greater number who endeavor to suppress all attempts at investigation. Mr. DeWitt does not imply that everyone who supports the proposed constitution did so with evil intent but that the vast majority seem to want to suppress any attempt to investigate the details of the document. It may surprise you that Mr. DeWitt lays the blame for this apparent rush to judgment on many of the same people Americans vilify today. These violent partisans are for having the people gulp down the gilded pill blindfolded, whole, and without any qualification whatever. These consist generally of the noble order of Cincinnatus, holders of the public securities, men of great wealth, and expectations of public office. Bankers and lawyers, these with their train of dependents, form the aristocratic combination. The lawyers in particular keep up an incessant declamation for its adoption. Like greedy grudgeons, they long to satiate the voracious stomachs with a golden bait. The numerous tribunals to be erected by the new plan of consolidated empire will find employment for ten times their present number. These are the loaves and fishes for which they hunger. Seems well over 200 years later, little has changed when it comes to class warfare. The haves versus the have-nots is as old as time, as is the vilification of lawyers and their relationship with those who make the laws they claim to serve. The time draws near for the choice of delegates. I hope my fellow citizens will look well to the characters of their preference and remember the old patriots of 75. They have never led them astray nor need they fear to try them on this momentous occasion. As Massachusetts was preparing to choose delegates for the ratification convention, Mr. DeWitt urged his fellow citizens to seriously consider the character of those whom they would choose, something we in the 21st century should consider each and every time we vote. Is anyone else amazed at how similar the political discourse of today mirrors that of 1787? Censorship, class warfare, and necessity all trotted out in the name of protecting the American people. With 237 years of experience, which of these two camps were right? The best answer I can give is both. Granted, no one can prove what would have happened if the ratification debates had gone differently. I do think history has shown that a strong central government has been as helpful in foreign affairs as has been detrimental in domestic Slavery, racial discrimination, fascism, and communism may not have been defeated if not for the might of a powerful central government. Then again, it has been that same strong central government that has helped keep racism and communism as an integral part of American life. As the Federalists warned, the Bill of Rights demanded by the Anti-Federalists has been used to regulate and abuse the very rights it was supposed to protect. As we look back through history, I hope you'll agree with me that uh, there's a lot to learn from both sides. For example, the struggle between a ruling elite and a free and independent people, between centralized versus distributed power, and the character of the men and women chosen for office are important. But let's not forget that the very same power of government 
that can protect our rights can also infringe on them. Now more than ever, I think the American people need to remember the words of James A. Garfield. Now more than ever before, the people are responsible for the character of their Congress. If that body be ignorant, reckless, and corrupt, it's because the people tolerate ignorance, recklessness, and corruption. If it be intelligent, brave, and pure, it's because the people demand these high qualities to represent them in the national legislature. Now, I hope to do more comparisons between these two sets of essays. While they do not align exactly, they often cover similar topics. Now, as Santiano warned, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Well, there you go. The first of the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist Papers, both dealing with the question of, should we adopt the Constitution? The Federalist saying, yes, this is a great deal. We need a stronger central government that can do what we ask it to do. The Anti-Federalist saying, wait, let's slow down and examine this a little closer. Let's take time to consider because we're concerned about the infringement of rights. Seems to be a debate that continues to go on today. Now, let me know if you'd like to see more of these. I don't know if I'll do all of the papers, but... There are certain ones I think would be really worth looking at. Let me know at the website, constitutionstudy.com. You can find the written version of this article, including links to my source documents, so you can double-check my work, and if you want, read the entire papers. I also hope you take time to consider supporting the work that we do here, either by purchasing something from our store or donating there as well. It's constitutionstudy.com slash shop. You can also support us with your cell phone. Patriot Mobile is America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. And it's great because they support organizations well, like the Constitution Study, uh, NRA, Sanctity of Life, all of these things. So you can use your cell phone and when you pay your bill, your money's not going to destroy people's rights, but to support them. Go to patriotmobile.com slash constitution, find a plan that works for you, and be sure to use the code constitution at checkout and you'll get free activation. So again, go there today. The website is patriotmobile.com slash constitution. And the promo code is CONSTITUTION to get free activation when you check out. I also hope you check out The Miracle of America. I found this study course. They approached me and we looked at it and I made you a deal. So you can try it out free. You can get one lesson free by going to constitutionstudy.com slash 1776 study guide. That's the numerals, 1776 study guide. It'll take you to their website, to a special landing page, just for Constitution Study listeners. You can check out the details and enroll for your free class on God's natural law. I think you'll like the the lesson so much, you'll be willing to buy the whole course for just $17.76. Now, you get the downloadable study guide absolutely free. You can watch on video or listen on audio. But again, once you try your free lesson, if you want to take the rest of the course, it's just $17.76. So I hope you'll try at least take the free lesson and hopefully learn something. I also hope you'll share this episode with friends, with family, on the internet, wherever you can. Share all the content I have. All the content on the website, Constitution Study, is for you to share. Not just to use, but to share. So I hope you'll share. I hope you talk to friends and family. Who knows? Maybe bring a few of them by next time when we get together for the Constitution Study.